Well, good morning. Stand with us. Welcome to New Hope Church. We're going to praise our King. and welcome here to New Hope Church. <laughs> to our online audience, a special welcome to you and thank you for joining us in virtual space. Uh, my name is uh, Toby, this is my wife Lindy and we get to be the worship pastors here at New Hope. Uh, yes, thank you. This week I would love to start with by telling you a testimony. 
Um, so a lot of you know that we've been struggling with a lot of immigration and visa stuff. And uh, we've been doing all the hard work by getting the lawyers and filling in the paperwork again and again and again and again. Um, but also a lot of you have been doing hard work with us by praying for us. And I even get texts of people going, I've been fasting for you guys and praying for you guys. So on Wednesday, I got a call saying, your status has been approved and now you're good for another year in Canada. Yes. So we are truly excited. And the reason I share that with you is because there's so much power in a testimony. That's why the Bible is also full of testimonies, if you think about it. Like we read the stories about the Israelites and how, what God did for them. That is a testimony. And we get to read that and go, God, I'm going through stuff. And I know you're the same God. You're the God that did this for the Israelites. You're the God that did a miracle for Toby and Lindy. You can do a miracle for me, right? So it encourages us to, to come to God and go, God, we, we stand in your word. One of my favorite pastors goes, sometimes he just opens up the Bible to his story. He this God, I, I need this in my life. And that's good. That's why we have the Bible. We can stand on the word of God. And the second reason I love to share it is because we need to celebrate and we need to thank God for what he's done. So as we go into this time of worship, I'm sure you all have things that you are thankful for. Okay, not a lot, but there's some thankfulness. Uh, we can pray for that as the service goes on. But I'm sure you have things in your life that you're th thankful for. Just the fact that God saved us all is something massive to be thankful for. So let's do that. Let's thank Him for what He's done in our lives as we sing this song. And we're going to sing a song later on called Waymaker. And uh, during that song, I'm going to encourage you to bring your requests and your needs and your wants before God, saying, God, this is what I need, and I trust you because I know you are the same God. You are the miracle-working God. Amen? Amen? All right, here we go. <laughs> without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed only beauty remains my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began I'm a sinner no more Come on! Mine was the ransom He faithfully bore He canceled my debt And he called me his friend When death was arrested And my life began Sing it out! For oh, your grace so free Washes up On a criminal's cross Darkness rejoiced As though heaven has lost Are you ready?
here to worship the only God of the universe, the way maker. You are a promise keeper. You're a healer. And we get to worship you. That is who you are. Stop working Even when I don't see it You're working Even when I don't feel it You're working You never stop You never stop working You never stop
ask God, you know our heart's desires, you know our needs. And don't just want to take 20 seconds and just come before God with your desires and your needs this morning and your mountains and your giants that you are trusting God for, that you are trusting God for a breakthrough for. Let's take some time and just pray and ask our Father who always wants the best for us. God, time and time again, I just stand amazed at how good you are and how you always come through as we, uh, with our human stupidity, doubt you sometimes, God. We repent of that and say, we know you are the same God you was yesterday. The God that freed the Israelites is the God that can free us today. And we just thank you for that, God. Thank you that we can be in relationship with you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are working in each and every person here right now and that you hear every single prayer that went out and say, God, I need you in this part of my life. Thank you that we get to listen to Pastor Nathan this morning. And um, we just say we are ready to listen and to receive this word in love and alongside the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in that, and uh, thank you for joining us here this morning. Welcome here. Uh, my name is Pastor Nathan, and I get to wrap up our series uh, on marriage. It was entitled, Raising the Bar on Marriage and Singleness. Okay, and today we're going to look at the topics of divorce, remarriage, and singleness. Oh, there, I assume there would not be a thunderous round of applause when I shared that. Uh, but, but my prayer for you today, wherever you're at, is that you'll hear hope as we study these topics and as we study these texts. Wherever you're at today, I know one thing is true, and that is that God desires to meet you here today. Now, last week, Pastor Jay uh, painted for us, showed us what the ideal is in Scripture. It, one man, one woman, one flesh with God. Now, that's the ideal, but what if that doesn't happen? Today, we're going to unpack the what ifs of how it doesn't happen. And, and we're going to start by looking at divorce. Divorce is, in just other words, a, a separation, a divide, a disunity. Or in Hebrew, the word is actually a cutting off of the flesh, an amputation or a severing of one's body. Now, none of those words sound like our God, do they? Our God who seeks to unite and reconcile and restore and redeem all things. C.S. Lewis gives this quote on divorce. He says, Christians all regard divorce as something like a cutting up of a living body, as a kind of surgical operation. Some think that it is, uh, it is an operation so violent it shouldn't be done, it cannot be done at all. Others admit that it is a desperate remedy in extreme cases. But either way, they all agree that it is more like having your legs cut off than it is dissolving some sort of business partnership or deserting a regiment. Married people, can I en encourage you to never threaten divorce. Never threaten divorce in an argument. Never entertain it because it's not from God and is not his design. And if you've ever tried like I have to live outside of God's design, you know pretty quickly it doesn't work. And the statistical realities of di divorce will serve as proof that it doesn't work. And whether you're a Christian here or not today, we can agree that the breakdown of the marriage, the breakdown of families in our culture is a tragedy. And it's leading to some really staggering and unfortunate statistics. But the divorce rate is around 50% for, for first marriages, over 60% for subsequent marriages. And that's only if people actually get married, which in our day and age, the union isn't sacred much at all. The financial implications of divorce are horrendous. It's, as Pastor Tom often says, one of the leading causes of poverty in our world. Neither men nor women benefit from divorce. They both suffer. Both spouses suffer mentally, physically, they suffer emotionally, and for sure, they suffer financially. 
No one wins in a divorce, maybe except the lawyer, but even then, I don't think they like it. It's almost like a tearing part, a part of their whole world, and that world includes kids. The Canadian government's website says this, and yes, the irony that we are quoting the Canadian government's website <laughs> in a sermon isn't lost on me, but bear with me. Studies found that children of divorced families experience low levels of well-being regardless of achievement, conduct, uh, psychological development. The impact of divorce hits them most cruelly as they go in search of love and sexual intimacy and commitment. Their lack of inner images of a man and a woman in a stable relationship and their memories of their parents' failure to sustain the marriage badly hobbles their search, leading them to heartbreak and even despair. This is, again, from the Canadian government's website sharing that divorce hurts all parties. Now, I gotta pause here as we reflect on statistics and just celebrate the fact that we worship a way maker that operates way above and outside of any statistic, amen? amen? But we will agree today that divorce hurts everyone involved. And it's precisely why exactly a year ago we launched the Kingdom Legacy Initiative. This initiative was meant for us as a church to be focused on passing on biblical truth to our kids of who they are, who God is, how they were created. The second pillar was that we would actually plant families in Christ, that Christ would be the rock that we build our families on. In his mission, we would be families on mission together. And then thirdly, we wanted to partner with his church, partner with one another and seeing the kingdom come. We're gonna revisit this kingdom legacy because it is equally important to focus on marriages, families planted in Christ Christ the center. And we're gonna revisit that later this month. We hope you'll join us for one of those vision nights. But if you're like me and you read some of these stats, you'll probably wonder why do people even get divorced? They know it's not good. Why would you do it? Well, it's kind of a naive question, isn't it? Represented in this room alone are a lot of stories of hurt and pain. And so I ask that you just bear with me in this message as I unpack some lies behind divorce. And then we look at the hope First lie behind many divorces is the lie of greener grass. Someone out there is going to love me better. They're going to love me more fully, love me as I deserve to be loved. They're going to talk to me more. They're going to care for me more. They'll provide better for me, and I know they've got to be intimate with me much more often. There is a truer, better soulmate out there for me. And this is the grass is greener lie. The Bible calls this envy, jealousy, greed. In many relationships, the grass is greener lie permeates throughout them all. It could be at our workplace. It could be with uh, our employer, our job. It can even happen in your church. But we know it often happens with spouses. And this is actually, this lie is one of the leading causes of adultery and affair. The second lie is that the kids will be happier if we were divorced. You did just hear some of the stats I shared, right? We know that that's not true. We know it's a lie. But in counseling, when I was doing counseling, I've heard kids say, we will be happier when our parents are divorced. Let's quickly unpack that statement. This means that the home they live in is so painful, so unstable, so full of arguing and blow-ups, that the, the pain of the divorce is less than the pain they live each and every day at home. That statement shouldn't be used as a justification or a qualifying statement for divorce. Instead, mom and dad need to work on their marriage and their home. Children deserve both their parents. And the third lie that we've often heard is somehow divorce will be less work than what you're living right now. Whether it's with your coworkers, your friends, your family, your in-laws, or your life group, all relationships are hard work all relationships, and that is obviously including marriages. They take work. I'm not sure why we're always constantly surprised that relationships take such hard work. It's the hard work that we are called to do, the hard work of loving with one another and bearing the burdens together. It might actually do us well to just accept that that's the reality for all relationships because they're gonna take hard work, but the hard work of building a strong marriage on Christ will continue to pay off in dividends for years to come. And the lie that somehow we can avoid this hard work through divorce is obviously just that. It's a lie. 
you're still going to be doing a lot of hard work, arguably harder and more painful work. But I'm sure, again, we're probably all wondering, but what about abuse? What about adultery? They completely abandoned our family. I'll say more about that in a second, but just bear with me. Remember, we're calling us to raise the bar, to remember the ideal, so that we can battle the lies that seem to come to us in our marriages, in our relationships. We're called to remember to be one flesh, remember the beauty of mutual submission, an ongoing cycle of loving and respecting one another. Not what the world paints as marriage, a sort of transactional experience where you're nice to me, so I'm nice to you. It's way better than that. It's way deeper and it's way more profound than that. Christians are called, like Christ, to lay ourselves down for one another. That is indeed raising the bar in marriages. Now, the statistics of remarriage are just worse than the first, so I won't go into too many of those details. All I'll say is, in your first marriage, your relationship with God is your first priority. Then your relationship with your spouse, and then your relationship with your kids. And the reason this works is because as we do what Scripture says, abide in God's love, that love overflows from us to our wife. And when we're better with our spouse, our wife, or our husband, we are now going to be better parents to our kids. We're united. We're full of love. We're ready to love them, even when they spill everything, every single meal, over and over again. <laughs> that certainly <laughs> requires God's love to be patient. This is the, the, the idea of prioritizing God, our spouse, and then our kids. And when divorce has happened, your priority now gets to be God and your kids. God first, and then your kids second. And I'll reiterate that because the statistics of live-in boyfriends and girlfriends are horrific. The statistics of abuse from step-parents is horrific. A study titled Child Abuse and Other Risks of Not Living with Both Parents says that children are 40 times more likely than those with their bio parents to be sexually or physically abused. The study goes on to say that children without both bio parents are 50 times more likely to actually die of physical injuries from such abuse. These are worrying and disturbing statistics. They are scary. They should probably anger us a little bit. This is actually what injustice looks like in our world, just so we're clear. We need to stand with children who have very little voice. And we at New Hope will do just that. We will continue to advocate for those without a voice. We're gonna do that by asking adults to stay single. We know it, you might be lonely. We know it will be difficult. We know you won't like our advice and might not respect it, but we're not gonna stop advocating for the least of these, for children, for children whose voice in our society has been drowned out by the selfish desires of adults. It might be hard to say, hard to hear, but this is what raising the bar in marriage actually looks like. This is what raising the bar on singleness actually looks like. And if the church won't stand up and say, there's kids that are hurting, someone do something, then who will? For more context on this, I encourage you to read the book, Them Before Us, which talks about advocating for children in our current world. And so, yes, we might encourage singleness for a season, possibly. Paul instructs in, in 1 Corinthians 7 that we should just stay single. And we'll call you to that at times. It'll allow you most likely to find better healing. It'll allow you to encounter Christ in a deeper and more profound way. It'll allow you to be the parent that your children needs, maybe in that time of crisis and pain. And it will certainly, as the statistics share, allow you to avoid potentially putting them in further harm. Coming up at our marriage seminar in two weeks on March 18th, you're gonna hear of testimonies of amazing godly women in our church that were called to be single and what God did in that season. You're not gonna wanna miss that. Remarriage is extremely difficult. Blended families are extremely difficult. There's so much work. So what does the Bible say about all this? Divorce, remarriage, singleness, and why is there allowances in scripture at all for divorce? If it's so bad, why not just say it's bad, period, stop, we, we're done? Why not just condemn it? 
Well, you see, after the garden, we've no longer lived in the ideal. Sin corrupted the world. As soon as Adam and Eve wanted to be like God, that desire has corrupted generation and marriage and relationship ever since. And we begin to see in the Torah, in the law, in Deuteronomy 24, laws start being spoken about divorce and surrounding it. It's like God saying, this, my friends, is the ideal. This is how I've created you, but you've sinned. You, you chose not to live that way. And so I, I'm gonna try to provide you with some guidance in the hopes that you don't per further perpetuate the hurt, that the sin doesn't just keep hurting other people as well. For an example, we all know, and I think we can all agree, I know the Bible sure agrees that abuse is not right. So when someone says to me, that my husband has hit me, but we wanna reconcile, we wanna to stay together, would you walk us through this? Well, we still all agree that abuse is not right. But what if they say to me, it's been four times? Well, it's been four times though over eight years. Or it's been three times, but it's been three times each week. You see, agreeing on the principle is good, and we should. But how that actually plays out in reality of our sinful, broken relationships becomes infinitely more complex. And that is exactly like marriage in Scripture. Scripture is really clear about marriage. But when it comes to our lives, <laughs> boy, it gets infinitely more complex, doesn't it? That's why God adding some laws in Deuteronomy is the most loving thing he could do. He wanted the ideal for us, but in our brokenness and in our sin, he still desires justice for each of us. That's his love, and that's what Deuteronomy 24 is about, trying to give rights to all parties involved. It's speaking of divorce and remarriage. It's not endorsing divorce. The text is elevating one another, and specifically, this text in Deuteronomy 24 elevates in the equity of women at the time. So the Pharisees know this, they know this law. And then in Matthew 19, they come trying to trap Jesus, trying to figure out exactly how the law applies to every situation and mostly trying to ask who then is eligible, who's unclean, who can, uh, who, which women can you divorce? And this is how we'll pick this up in Matthew 19, verse three. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. He's calling us back to the Genesis one, high and holy calling. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Again, now they're referencing Deuteronomy, but they're referencing it wrongly. It was not a command to divorce. It was a parameter around divorce. It was actually protecting people. And Jesus replied in verse eight, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciple said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it, it, it is better not to marry. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs, singleness, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept it Accept this, should accept it. Five principles from what Jesus is saying. Divorce is not his design. Number two, it's evidence of a hard heart. A root of bitterness is, is in there. Number three, that it is permitted in the context of sexual immorality. Number four, remarriage outside of these circumstances is seen as adultery because God doesn't recognize that divorce in his eyes. And that Principle is actually reiterated in the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke. And number five, some should remain single. Why? For the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Now, those five would be really good to talk about in your life group this week as you dig deeper. But Paul goes on to build, in this, build on those principles in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, to the unmarried, 
and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do, but they cannot control themselves. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say this, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Here's some other principles kind of reiterated by Paul in this text. First is that we need to be single so that we can be on mission with Christ, so that our heart is not divided, but so we can be sold out in love, in relationship with Jesus and his spirit. Number two is an urge, urging here to not separate. Why? Well, the, the church of Corinth at the time were unequally yoked. There is a Christian and a non-Christian. And they thought, wow, this isn't right. This isn't what the law says. So we've got a divorce. So I can be single and then just worship God as a Christian. And here Paul's going, whoa, 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 don't perpetuate breaking of vows. Don't perpetuate sin and divide. Stay in the relationship you are in. And then number three, Paul's giving us a second permission here for divorce. If the unbelieving spouse abandons you. So for these texts and others, you'll hear us at New Hope always encouraging reconciliation. You'll hear us discouraging divorce, and you'll hear us often trying to leave room for the miraculous, trying to leave room for it. After all, we worship a God who is reconciling and restoring and redeeming all things to himself, every relationship. And you might hear us from time to time talking a couple through what sounds like separation, a plan to spend time apart. Pastor Tom's done that twice in 38 years, but the plan is meant for, to increase accountability and work towards a goal. Because here, Paul actually is talking about separation in verse five. He speaks to separating, but separating so you can pray, spend time with God, and so then you can come back together. So this separation that is being spoken about in scripture isn't grounds for divorce. Not misery or poverty, sickness or bitterness, not weight gain. As I said in first service, because my wife was here, I said, hair loss doesn't count. There's a couple of amens out there. I, I can see you guys. It's bright. Listen, I'm sure if you're like me, we hear these texts in scripture and we start to run scenario after scenario after scenario. Maybe it's your own life. Maybe it's the life of your parents. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's the people in your life group who've gone through these situations and now you're trying to figure out how does all this apply to them? Well, this message unfortunately wasn't meant to address every single scenario. Instead, this was meant to cap off a series on raising the bar to oneness, to unity, to reconciliation and raising the bar in singleness. These allowances in scripture for divorce, these concessions, are not commands to divorce. If they, then we should. Instead, we have tons of marriages here at New Hope that are thriving on the other end of these sort of pains, these sort of sins. Many of them are in our leadership and we'd be happy to share with you. And so we don't begin to take these texts and now look for loopholes, a little bit of like a get out of a relationship free card, you know? I saw what he looked at on his phone, that's adultery. Um, justified in leaving. Or gentlemen, you know, if you catch her watch, reading Fifty Shades of Grey or watching Magic Mike, you go, she's lusting, I know it, I'm out of here. Listen, if you're looking for any sort of text in scripture to justify dividing, division amongst any relationship, you're just not gonna find it. That's not the God we serve and worship, that's not his heart and that's not how he's created us. 
Instead, the marital covenant began with a beautiful high and holy calling, a calling to oneness. Then, because we're broken, because we're sinful, in Deuteronomy, we see a law that's calling us back to oneness, actually. It's exemplifying God's grace for our sinful state, and it's allowing us to elevate one another in society. And then Jesus, like Jesus always does, comes along and calls us back to the high and holy calling, to the abundant life, just like he did in laying his life down for us. And so I'm not sure where this message finds you today. Wherever you are, I encourage you, there's one step we all can take, and that is to bring our life right now, our current situation, under the lordship of Jesus today. If you're single, you can do that today. You can surrender to him. You can find fulfillment in the loving relationship, in the embrace of your father. You can worship him, sold out on mission with him. If you're dating, be cautious. Build your relationship on the rock and make sure you think through every decision. Don't underestimate the importance of it. And if you're happy, happily married, or maybe if you're unhappily married, you get to put in the work of building oneness. You get to see if this abundant life is true by starting to submit to one another, to lay your life down for one another. You're not too far gone. Feel and hear hope today. Because if you're hearing shame, if all you can think about is past relationships, past sin, if you sit here feeling so unworthy as we read those texts, that is not from God. In John chapter four, this is our God. Jesus approaches a woman at the well. He says in verse four, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replies. And Jesus said to her, what you have said is true. You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you are with now is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. This is our God. He approaches her. He definitely does confront her sin. That's what a loving God would do wouldn't want us all to keep sinning and hurting ourselves. But he approaches her, and what he does next is to offer her everlasting life. What he does next is to offer her a water that will quench an eternal thirst, a never-ending thirst, the water that only he can give. And he meets you the same way today. He wants to quench your never-ending thirst. He wants to indeed, and his spirit does, confront all of our sin. And then he comes with his flood of grace and mercy and his forgiveness. And then he just reminds us that the bar is still here in our marriages, in singleness. He raises the value on all men and all women. He raises the value of children in our society. And Paul does the exact same, raising the value of singleness because we are called to an abundant life with Christ. And this is the abundant, beautiful life that scripture speaks about that we can live into. It is his design. So how at New Hope do we raise the bar on marriage and singleness? How can we do a better job of that? Well, we can embrace people who are single, who have chosen that life for a season or for their lifetime. And we can build a more solid foundation around them. We can be their church family. It is after all what we were called to do in scripture. We can build marriages on the solid rock of Jesus, on the truth of the Bible, and we can live into a higher and holier calling. Remember, he died for us that we might live in freedom. So the bar is high. Yep, indeed it is. And God meets us when we fall short with grace and forgiveness and offers us the abundant life. Our God redeems, renews, and reconciles all things. And he desires to do that in all of our relationships, marriages included. So, new hope. Let's get to work. If you're single or dating or married, let's get to work. Let's put in the work because our world needs strong, godly marriages. Our world needs strong, godly people. And our children in the generations to come deserve strong, godly examples in their life. We get to choose today to bring our lives under the Lordship of Christ, and he will not waste it. He will work in a powerful and mighty way. Are we ready for that? God, we thank you 
for your patience with each of us. God, we're sorry. We're sorry for how many times, even in our own hearts, we're just so divisive. We, we accept it. We, we, we hear the lies. Sometimes we even we say them out to friends and family. We're, we repent of that, God. We want to be ministers of reconciliation like your scripture calls us to, and that starts in our own lives, in our own homes, in our own marriages. God, for where we're afraid, where we're weak, where we're not sure, would you give us wisdom? Would you give us strength? Would you give us your Holy Spirit to go before us? God, a new hope be full of people following you, sold out for you in our heads, in our hearts, and in our homes. We surrender them all to you today. Amen. In the book of Daniel, we read of a egomaniac King Nebuchadnezzar who builds a massive statue of gold and forces his people to worship it. Refusal means to be thrown to your death into the fiery blast furnace. Daniel's friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow down to the godless king or his idol. Their love for God caused them to have resolve to stand and not bow down. They said, our God, whom we are serving, exists. And he is able to rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will rescue us, O king, from your power as well. But if he doesn't, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not pay homage to the golden statue you have erected. Enraged, the king throws them into the fire. But the fire did not consume them. Instead of the three of them in the fire, there was another, another in the fire, talking with them. Jesus came to them as he comes to each one of us. Right into the fiery pain of our lives, Jesus comes to us to be with us, to deliver us, to walk us out of the furnace into a new life. He said he would never leave or forsake us. And he said to remember that the bread of communion represents his body that was broken for us. And the cup represents his blood that was shed for us. Jesus took our punishment and our judgment. He was nailed onto a cross meant for us so that we could walk out of the fire, out of the fire of divorce, out of the fire of sickness, the fire of our broken hearts, so that we could walk out of the fire unsinged, unharmed, not even smelling of smoke, fresh and clean and restored and new, new creations in Christ Jesus. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus, you've confessed your sins and repented and called out for him to save you and to be your Lord and Savior, this bread and this cup is for you. If that's not where you're at right now, that's cool. Just give it a miss. But if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, come and remember. Before you get out of your seat, take some time to examine yourself and repent of your sin. Notice where perhaps the fruit of the Spirit is still lacking and ask why is that so? And how might the gospel come and take out that fleshly pride, that self-righteousness, that self-sufficiency. Confess anew your total dependence on the love of Jesus to bear his fruit in you. And then when you're finished listening, the Holy Spirit says, it's time to come forward. Come and remember the body and the blood of Christ that was broken and shed on your behalf. You can come to the front or the station in the back 
and there's gluten-free options there for you. And then after you have partaken, go back to your seat with a heart filled with joy, the joy of your salvation. Jesus, we thank you for your body and your blood that was broken and shed for us. Thank you for meeting us right now in the fire, in the furnace, and the promise to walk us out, one day to walk us face to face with the Father for all of eternity. We worship you, our wonderful Lord and Savior. In your name we pray, Jesus, amen.
sing. I'll count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. Amen. Wow. Great new song. That really tied into my communion thing. Really smart. Well done. Hey, listen, friends, don't live in defeat, okay? There's another there standing with you in the fire. And he's provided very, very practical help for you. It's called his church. And there's a connect card online or in the chair in front of you. And you can fill that out and put it in the offering and connect with us. And let's let the adventure of healing and thriving begin together. One of the ways we want to help you with that is with our marriage seminar that's coming up. Who should attend the marriage seminar, people? Everyone, that's right, because we are surrounded with uh, mm, inferior marriages all around, and we want to become experts at helping each other thrive in our marriages. So what are we going to do? We got two short videos from a secular clinical psychologist, one on divorce and one on family income. We have a Bible study on marriage from Genesis 2 and 4, Ephesians 5, 1 Corinthians 6, 7, and Matthew 19. We'll get all that in. We have an interview with Emily Robbins and Lisa Osborne Woo! on being single at New Hope. It's awesome. You won't want to miss that. We have a presentation that you're going to love called Not You're Not Broken, Rebuilding Intimacy in Your Marriage. And there'll be one-on-one -on -one couples uh, breakouts, focusing on his needs and her needs, and simultaneously, there'll be a singles breakout on what a good date night should look like. Then there'll be a couple of panel digging deeper discussions with your pastoral staff throughout the morning or throughout the day, uh, answering your questions and, and, and dialoguing on some of the radical things I've said and unpacking that for you. And, uh, and then there'll be lunch, laughter, much, much more for a donation of $10. That includes lunch. Are you kidding me? That's nuts. That's crazy. And you know why we can do that? We can do that because you and the people around you who have low income, moderate income, average income every week, fill out an offering envelope or go online and e-transfer to giving at New Hope Church Niagara. And they trust God with their giving. Come up to the front, put it in the boxes, however you give. And that allows us to do this and... Have you noticed the steel by the pond? Our new sanctuary, have you seen that? Have a look at that. Paid for that with cash, baby. Cash. Oh yeah. Now it's not assembled yet. That'll cost a little bit more. And that's why we're gonna have a vision briefing meeting. We had one, we launched our giving initiative, our Kingdom Legacy Giving Initiative a year ago. And a lot has changed since then. And we wanna update you. Um, you know that inflation has happened. Post-COVID supply chain issues have happened. Our congregation has grown a potential recession. More importantly, lost brothers and sisters have come home to the Father and been baptized, right? How good is that? So we just want to be totally open, honest, and transparent with you at every opportunity. And the best way we know how to do that is at a vision briefing. There'll be three of them. You can go online and register for those. Please say yes to that because we want to keep everyone informed so we can all move forward together as a church and so we can pray intelligently. So click yes to that uh, and, uh, and, and, and register for that online. So on that note, we are going to continue the service out in the tent where someone will tell you about their stubbed toe and you will gather some people and lay hands and pray for God's healing. Or probably they're gonna tell you something even more important and you can pray for each other and encourage each other and build each other up. Good for that? Yeah. Yeah. Good for that? Let's go. Lord, bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you his joy and his peace now and until Jesus comes again. Amen. See you in the tent. <laughs>